when when you're in it by yourself like i have been this this whole time if i fail i was like if i fail it's just gonna be all on me you know i can't like blame my boss or like my coworker or human resources or so and so right it's just all on you and that is uh it's a very heavy thing to carry this episode contains adult language and adult humor since when have trumpet players ever been considered adults if you are easily offended by these types of conversations consider switching to the oboe welcome to the trumpet gurus hang podcast i'm your host jose johnson my guest for this episode is estella aragon estella is an innovator while obtaining her master's degree in performance estella became obsessed with devising new techniques to teach music as a result, her unique teaching methods earned her first prize at the 2014 Savvy Arts Venture Competition. Estella is the founder of the Trumpet Headquarters in the Music Fit Academy. She's a performer, educator, and successful entrepreneur. And she's just getting warmed up. So, pour yourself a big glass, pull up a chair, and let the hang begin. Welcome to a new episode of the Trumpet Gurus Hang, and uh, I am joined by Estella Aragon. So, Estella, how are you today? I'm doing great because I'm here. So, <laughs> you're here, and you've got trumpets on the wall. I mean, what more can you ask for? I mean, really, that's that's really just life goals: trumpets on the wall, an office, yeah. lawn workers. You know, all, all those wonderful things that, that, that life brings us. So, uh, yeah, I really wanted to thank you for uh, for taking the time with me today because uh, you've got some really interesting stuff going on. Um, and I think some really interesting perspectives. And, you know, as we have uh, had to transition into this new reality that is, uh, I was, uh, you know, I can't even say post-COVID anymore because it looks like it ain't going away. Um, but in this, this new paradigm that's been created uh, as a result of the pandemic, uh, we're seeing more and more people finding it necessary to venture into the world of technology and virtual teaching and things like that. So, um, you know, this is something that you, you have been doing, obviously, prior to uh, the necessity uh, to do it. But uh, so you've kind of got a, a head start on it. So I, I really like to dive into to that and like, you know, what got you started in, in that field uh, or that venue of, of presenting your, your trumpet skills and, you know, the, the lessons that you've learned and, and all the great stuff that you've got going on. So, you know, why don't we just kind of start back at the at, at the beginning of, uh, you know, kind of that transition from you being just the, the traditional trumpet studio teacher uh, to some of the stuff that, that you're doing now. Awesome. Great. So, um, you know, I, I founded uh, Music Fit Academy, which is my private face-to-face -face studio where I see my students, you know, every week, like a normal studio. Um, back in 2014, that was shortly after I graduated with my master's degree in trumpet performance, and I had very little money. And I was like, I need to do something now because, you know, I just finished a master's what do we do now which is i feel like everybody gets you know most most musicians get there and they're like okay i'm done with six years of school <laughs> what's gonna happen now um and i knew at that point like i already knew i didn't really want to go and like audition at a billion symphonies um i didn't want to be a band director there, there were so many things i didn't want to do um, and there was one thing that I had always had my eye on, which was to have my own business because I grew up in a family, um, with businesses and, uh, seeing that, you know, as I was growing up, my, my parents had their business. My mom currently has her, um, her own business that she's had for about 15 years. And just seeing that level of independence just was really attractive. So, um, shortly after graduating, I founded Music Fit and it was just one of those things where, you know, I, I gathered... 80 or, or 90 emails and I sent them all out to as many band directions as I could find within a 30 mile radius of me, which I was in Columbia, South Carolina at the time. And I heard back from like six <laughs> and they're like, okay, sure, come over. Um, I was offering a free masterclass. I was like, hey, I'll do a free masterclass. I'll come to your school and free, right? So they're like, sure, yes, come, let's do it. 
So I went from those endeavors, I picked up about four or five kids and I would uh, have them come over to my very, very tiny apartment, um, which only had one, like one room at the time. So I, I didn't even have a studio. I taught in my living room. Uh, sometimes while my fiance was cooking in the adjacent um, kitchen. So um, whatever it takes, you know, it was, it was that sort of like mid, midpoint in life when things are just kind of disarrayed, but the, you can make it work. Um, and so I did that for about a couple of years. And then as soon as she was done with her master's degree, I was ready to leave because I just, I never really connected to Columbia. And I was like, let's get out of here. So a month after she graduates, we moved to Austin, Texas, which is where we are now. And um, that was the point where everything changed for me because up until that point, I had done everything in person. Uh, so this was in 2016. I had done everything in person and we were moving. And I'm like, oh my God, okay, I'm gonna lose everything I've worked so hard for so far. Um, but you know, technology is a thing. So let me try to convince these parents to keep doing lessons with me um, virtually. And a couple of them were like, so I was like, okay, that's fine. And a lot of them were just really hesitant because of this stigma with online learning um, that you know that you you can't do a lot of things in online learning or that you can't fix an embouchure or that you can't teach a beginner, um, all these different things that are floating out there. Um, and I was like, well, you know, you don't lose anything by trying. Just give me a few lessons. Let's just do a few lessons. If you don't like it, you don't like it. Like, you know, it's me, like we've built rapport. I knew these kids, I knew their parents. So I moved and I ended up moving with about eight or nine students and I kept all of them. And, um, and that's how it all got started. Now, already at that point, I already had a vision. Like I always, I've always wanted to be detached from anything. So, um, I want to be free to fly away if need be to wherever, you know, I would, I would love to be able to just go to Europe for three months and have my job with me so that I can have a living and rent a place and do, you know, travel or, or whatnot. Um, and that's impossible to do when you are rooted somewhere, um, with, a, like a, a, a regular job, I guess. And, um, that, really, really drove me to keep pushing for this. And so that eventually turned into Trump headquarters, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> well, we're going to definitely get into that story too. So, <laughs> but I mean, well, that, that's, it, that's a really interesting progression. And I think the thing that, that kind of sticks out in my mind, the first thing is, is that, you know, the idea of, uh, being an entrepreneur mm -hmm. is something that is, it's kind of, in your, built into your DNA uh, mm -hmm. from your experiences. And, and I think a lot of people, that, that's a problem is that uh, they try to make these transitions, but uh, they don't have role models. They don't have examples, solid examples that, that are kind of burned into their psyche that, that can support them. Because being an entrepreneur, uh, it sucks sometimes, <laughs> you know? It, it's not, you know, there, there's not the, the joy of the steady paycheck, but then again, uh, that's the that's the price that you pay for the freedom that you have, and uh, I wouldn't have it any other way. Uh, but you know, the, it's the you know that that that's that's the route that, that you that you felt was calling you. But you know, it's amazing to me that more people who are you know they want to get a degree in performance, and you know you pretty much have to be an entrepreneur if you're going to be a professional musician especially these days i mean the the days of of getting a, a single gig that is going to pay you everything you need uh and have the longevity that you need there are very few jobs like that most most working musicians have to be uh of an entrepreneurial or solopreneur kind of uh perspective so uh you know when you when you were talking about though that you knew what you didn't want, um, is that is that the way that you kind of drive your life? Or are you are you more of a process of elimination? Or are you are you more of a, you know idealistic? I guess I am very much. Uh, I just really really know what I don't want, and so I I steer far away from it. Like I don't even look 
in that direction um, because to me it's just a waste of time and um, and uh, you know I I, I dream big. I, I always have. I, I feel like it's it's necessary to do that as an entrepreneur because if you are an entrepreneur and you think small, then you're not going to make it very far. Um, so yeah, I mean, I guess so. I guess I am sort of a process of elimination kind of person. I never actually thought about that until you just said it. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that, that's what I do. I kind of yeah. try to Try to get beneath the surface a little bit. Um, so when when you were making that that transition, and um, yeah, the, I think maybe this is this is the hardest part. Whether you're being a, a professional musician or an entrepreneur, or even trying to be in a relationship, uh, it's the rejection. It's the fear of rejection. That's the thing that holds so much of us back. Is is you know, well, what if somebody says no? Um, but that process that you went through, I mean, just, you know, the, first of all, starting your studio and, you know, reaching out to these band directors to, to go in and do master classes, which were, I guess, the, the early form, forms of uh, marketing funnels uh, that, uh, yeah, so you, you put yourself out there to do that. You uh, had a, a shift in your, your uh, living situation and you put yourself out also again to your, your existing students say, well, Hey, let's try this. And, and there's always the risk that people are going to say no. Um, and then you start your online stuff. And I'm, I'm sure that, you know, there's been, there've been plenty of yeses and plenty of no's with that as well. So how do you personally deal with, uh, that, that fear of rejection? What, what is your go-to mental strategy to, to keep you going when, you know, you're not getting the results immediately, the results that you want from, from a person or from a situation? Well, here's the thing about what I do is that, um, if I'm rejected, I'm usually just rejected by myself. Um, because I make everything that I do, I make it myself. I'm the salesperson and the marketer and the creator and the video editor and the teacher and all these different things. So, um, I, the, the, the rejection, the, 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 the fear of rejection that I've experienced has always been from myself. Um, I, I, I'm, maybe I'm very fortunate, but I've never really had someone like a professional or a professional colleague, um, be like, mm, I don't, you know, I don't think what you do is good. Um, on the contrary, I've had a lot of support from the music and the, the, the education, the trumpet community, uh, from people like you, you know, who want to have me talk about what I do. Uh, my students are always so just generous with their time and their, their ears. Uh, they're so perceptive. Um, sure, you know, sometimes I'll run into someone who's like, I think this method is, um, is erroneous, right? And so now usually that, you know, they have about three years of experience. And so it's like, well, just wait about 15 more and then you'll, and then you'll see what I'm trying to say, right? Yeah. Um, but those things are, are very normal. So self-rejection though is, a real thing, especially in entrepreneurship. So when I was trying to, you know, put Trump headquarters together, it was, it was, it was a process because it was like this monumental project that I had cooked up in my mind, which has no limits, but life has limits. And I had thought of this website with tons of, of resources and uh, free resources primarily because I was really at the time I was really focused on how much um, bad trumpet stuff there is on the internet and uh, and I would have students just showing up and with issues you know oh because I saw this video online of how to make your embouchure and it starts with your lips closed and and I would just you know, hear these things and think, oh my God. Um, so I had this vision for the website, right? And then that eventually morphed into having a course as part of that website to alleviate the same sorts of, of issues. Um, but, you know, you think about these things and you don't realize how big of an endeavor it actually is. Um, I had never worked with WordPress because I, I couldn't make, make a website like this without, with like Squarespace, which is what I was, accustomed to. And 
never worked with WordPress. I had never really done graphic editing. I had never done video editing or audio editing or graphic designer, what have you, all the different little gears, you know, that have to move um, for a website to work well and to work properly. And that's not even getting into SEO and coding and all the different things that go into websites. And so for a while, I just didn't start. Like I had the idea in 2015, but I didn't actually start working on it until late 2017 um, because it was it was just too big. And I just had this thing like, well, you know, I'll get to it, I'll get to it, I'll get to it. But it it just hung in the back of my head every single day because it was something that I had told myself that I wanted to accomplish. And every single day that I didn't, I was failing myself. And it really did feel that way every single day. Um, and then finally I got around to it and I worked really, really hard for about six months. And that's when the base of the website was finished uh, without the course. So that was all the free resources that are there now. That's when all that was done. But I burnt out. It was a lot of work. It was insane. Um, and that was sort of the, the stop sign right before the next big step, which was making the course. And that's when I was like, who's going to buy this? You know, like who's actually going to pay a monthly membership? Because at the time was when memberships were starting to turn into a real thing where now everything is a membership. Nice. I'm like, who's going to pay for a membership, uh, you know, for access to this? I mean, who, I don't know. I have, I have experience. Like I, I have faith in what I do, but are people going to, think that are people gonna you know look at me and go who like who even is this person that's teaching her? um what are her credentials uh you know so there was so much doubt there like so much doubt and my first line of defense was my fiance and my family they were the ones that supported me and they were like just do it i mean there were so many silly things that you think about you know what are they gonna say are people gonna email me telling me that this is terrible. Um, you know, I'm going to be like young in the, in these videos, how, how, how are they going to hold up? Like, what about 20 years? Like, how are they still going to be relevant? Am I going to have to keep changing them every few years to, to reflect, you know, new things and new technology. There were so many things that were, that I was pushing against, but, um, about six months after that. So I didn't do anything again for six months. Um, it, it fear of failure. It's a very real thing. And, um, about six months later, I was like, okay, you know, I had finally been convinced uh, by my friends and my family and myself that if I don't do it, well, it's just that I'm never going to know. And that to me was a lot scarier than any type of any level of failure. And at that point I was already starting to get in, you know, really dig into the Trumpet community and getting to know people. And I was seeing that this was actually necessary. It was a real thing that people out there really needed. Not everyone can afford $200 a month for private trumpet lessons. And, you know, $20 or $15 seemed a lot more attainable. My material is, is based on, on solid like, methods that have been around for forever, you know. It's not some like charlatan trying to sell, you know, trumpet courses that has been playing for three years, which people are out there doing that. Um, and so I went for it and I actually started doing it. And then that's a whole other story. <laughs> All right. All right. We'll, we'll get the story to part, <laughs> chapter three here in a moment. Chapter three, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, um, with in that, that, that arc that you, that you've been describing, um, it, that I think that, that our, our willingness to, deal with discomfort to deal with pain to deal with you know all the the crap that that life throws at you um that's the way we grow i mean a lot of times people want you know they want the comfort they want the happiness they want the joy they want the peace without understanding that you earn that through the struggle uh and and as a trumpet player i mean you, you should know that by now i mean you know how many hours you spend in you know in your practice room how many thousands of dollars you know do you spend on gear and, and education and things like that uh that's the price that you pay you know to to be good at anything um but 
I think when you start looking at it from, especially from, from a business perspective, from an entrepreneurial perspective, um, you know, you have to, you have to develop that willingness to continue on and, and look at the resistance that you face, not just as, um, it's, uh, to me, resistance is not always a bad thing. I like resistance. That's like with the horn. If your horn had no resistance, you wouldn't be able to play it. You need to have, you need to have the right kind of resistance and it needs to be in the right place because that focuses your energy. And when things go wrong, it, uh, you know, you, it focuses you into finding the, the right way and the more efficient way to do things. So I really love what you said about, you know, uh, you know, how you, regardless of what was going on and you, you know, you kind of, you know, put it off that you felt like you were letting yourself down. And I think when, when we come to that realization, that, that critical realization, we can look at ourselves in the mirror and say, you know what, I, you know, I'm not being true to me. So if I want to feel better about myself, I've got to do this work. And then that becomes your motivation. And, uh, I think that that applies to anything in life. So how did you, yeah. How did you move into then this, this next phase a little bit, uh, you know, as, as we're going into chapter three, how, how did that start to, to manifest itself? Uh, well, actually, before we get there, you, 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 you said something, um, that, that really triggers something, but the, I think that, you know, the biggest source of fear in, in entrepreneurship, doesn't matter what you're, what you're trying to sell is that if you fail, you're the only one that you can blame. Right. When, when you're in it by yourself, like I have been this, this whole time, if I fail, I was like, if I fail, it's just going to be all on me. You know, I can't like blame my boss or like my coworker or human resources or so-and-so, right? It's just all on you. And that is, uh, it's a very heavy thing to carry, um, at, at, in the beginning stages of this process for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, with failure, I kind of, I've had to, to create this mind shift for it. And uh, this is one of the things that I, I try to coach people on is like, you know, uh, that it's okay to fail because, you know, that's how you learn. You know, if you, if you knew how to do it, you would have done it. Yeah. You know, so you don't know how to do it. So you're learning. So you're going to, you're going you're gonna to screw up. So, okay. Accept failure is part of the process. And the second part is that just because you fail doesn't mean that you are a failure. And I think sometimes that's the hardest part, and especially as, as people who are passionate about what they do and their business is tied to their identity of who they are, that it's very easy to take those, those failures, those miscues, those mistakes, and put it all on ourselves in the negative connotation of, you know, I'm a screw up, I'm a failure, I'm this, I'm that, as opposed to I did the wrong thing, now I can correct it because, you know, I'm, I'm a winner. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm empowered or, you know, however you want to put that, but it's saying that you're, you're not a failure just because you fail. So, I mean, that, that's the, that's been one of the, the biggest thing I've seen in the entrepreneurial space that, that so many people put so much pressure on themselves that it becomes a negative pressure instead of a, a positive pressure. Exactly. Absolutely. So, um, chapter three. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> chapter three. It was a sunny wow. day. <laughs> The birds were chirping outside. Um, well, so I started actually, you know, uh, crafting the the structural pillars of this trumpet course. So I come from a family. My mom is a teacher. Uh, she owns a, a language school in Tampa, Florida. Uh, and I, I grew up, you know, watching her do that. Um, and she built it all on her own, just like I have done myself. And um, I watched her, you know, sort of develop things structurally, methodically, step by step. And I have learned a lot uh, from her in that aspect. So when I started, you know, trying to figure out what I was going to do for the course, um, first I had to develop a curriculum. And, you know, it has to be comprehensive and progressive and small bites, you know, um, from my experience teaching literally thousands of, of trumpet players from beginners to professionals, it, it was very, very apparent to me that most trumpet learning uh, resources out there move too quickly or are too complicated. They are too technical. And so I wanted to create something that was more simple, more to the point, and then 
provide a place where students could go to ask deeper questions where I can myself I can lead them down down those those you know side alleys where you're not gonna just introduce a student in that dark alley um, but maybe there is a necessity to take them down there and show them something that they need to know so I started developing the curriculum and I did that by doing a lot of research on what was already out there so I looked up any and all trumpet educational materials that were out there and I started writing down this purple notebook that I still have that I still use for ideas um, pros and cons on what I was finding you know I, I was just looking I'm like okay I really like the way he explains this and the way that the camera looks this way um, I don't like this and, 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 I don't, and I don't like that. And this is how I think I could improve upon this specific material. And then eventually I had a bunch of those and I put them all together and started developing the course. Um, now the course development, you know, it comes from experience teaching and knowing, you know, how long does it take a student to, to break that very first barrier if they're brand new? You can't know that unless you've done it right multiple many 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 times with many students the average the quick ones the fast ones and the average ones and so i got to take all these things into account that i had learned which was really exciting i love planning i love planning um and i started planning you know okay i need to teach this before i teach that this needs to come in beginner level this in the intermediate level this can't come until this comes in um things like that so i started developing it and then uh, I started the actual process of doing it and then I had to look into cameras and um, I kept it really simple actually, which was really hard to do because at the time all I wanted to do was go to the store and spend, you know, eight grand and buy the greatest stuff ever made for video production and put it in my space and create this amazing thing. But I didn't have eight grand. I had about $1,500. So with $1,500, I bought, you know, the camera and um, a new computer that could handle the editing and the editing software um, and a couple other things, right? But I had no lighting, like there was no lighting. I, I used natural light the, the first go around. And I say the first go around because I redid, we'll talk about this later, um, but I, I redid everything I did first time. Um, so I just went for it and, you know, it wasn't all beautiful it wasn't all pretty and it is so important to be able to let go of the details i used to be such a perfectionist and i wouldn't put anything out unless it was absolutely perfect and then i learned that it doesn't matter it really doesn't nobody cares the people that are actually consuming your content they're there for the content or for you or because they want to share your content they want to be entertained they want to be educated or they want to laugh those are the basic three reasons why people look up anything online. You know, they're, they're not there to look at the video and go, oh, this lighting is weird. No one's going to do that. So um, looking back, you know, <laughs> I did I did redo everything for a reason, but um, but the first go around was great because it allowed me to see that it didn't have to be perfect for it to actually sell. So I finished the beginner course and that was a real struggle because I wanted to put everything out together. I wanted to have the beginner and intermediate and the advanced course all launch at the same time. But it, it would have taken so long and my fiance just kept telling me just put out just the beginner stuff. That's okay. And I'm like, well, you know, people are going to land there and they're going to need more and they're going to be like, oh, this is just beginner stuff. And that was such a struggle for me to for me to do that. But I said, okay, fine, we'll just do it. And it was a great idea because people started buying it. And then I was like, oh, this is valuable. Okay, great. I know this actually sells. So slowly over the next year, I finished the intermediate and the advanced stuff. And I released everything um, all together in exactly a year ago, 2020, actually. Um, where the advanced stuff was totally finished. And that first weekend that I launched, it was actually Black Friday and I had this big sale. I had been building this newsletter from my videos on YouTube. 
um, you know, I, I had a market to sell to. I had been building an audience for a few years at that point. And that first weekend of Black Friday, I think I made like four grand just that first weekend. And that was the point of no return because I was like, people pay money. <laughs> This actually works like my hard work has paid off all the suffering. This is a real thing like I can make this work. Um, it, it. It's it's a very, very, very powerful and encouraging thing to see that. You know, people actually want what you're putting out there. Um, obviously, uh, but I would have never gotten to that point had I not done all these other things like building an audience and planning the sell campaign and all this, all these moving parts. Um, so yeah, I guess, I guess that's chapter three, uh, because it gets, it gets crazier after that. <laughs> no, it gets crazier. Are you kidding me? Crazy. No, I'm not. It's I'm, I'm a crazy person. Apparently you are not alone. Yeah. You are not alone. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit of a crazy person myself. So, um, no, but I, I think one of the things that you said that that I think bears, uh, you know, talking about a little bit more is, you know, what you're saying about that perfectionism, you know, and I've, I've got, uh, I, I launched an online academy uh, five, six years ago, uh, you know, created tons of courses and just hated every one of them. Yeah, I looked at it and go, oh my God, this, yeah, I really don't want to do this. But it was, it was necessity because I had students who couldn't always access me or needed my information. Yeah, you know, they, you know, it kind of really started because I had a few students who moved to another country. I'm like, oh, well, you yeah, know, there you go. So, but it's that, you know, like looking at it and going, well, I know it could be so much better, but then the reality sets in that the average person they they really don't care like you're saying they want access to the to the information or to you and then when we think about it in terms of our trumpet playing you know for our, for our trumpet community that's the same crap that we go through it's like you know when are you ever going to feel like you're good enough to be on whatever gig you're on right. you know it's like you know if you wait until the if you wait until you feel you're 100 percent prepared you will never get out of the practice room you will never set foot on stage you just have to go out there and you do it and then, you know, it, it probably won't be what you wanted. Uh, so then go back in the practice room, fix what's wrong, and then come back and do it the next time and do it better. So, um, you know, that, that willingness to just step out, do the best you can, given the resources that you have, and then allow, allow it to grow. And then as your, your technique, your abilities to do things, whether it be on the horn or, you know, your production skills or your marketing skills, as those improve, then you can improve the product. Uh, but if, if you never start with a product, you're never going to, you know, you're just never going to get anything done. So, I mean, I think that that's a, such an important life lesson. Um, so when you, uh, when you were going through uh, all that, you've got all your courses launched, you've, you've done, you, you've had, you mean, have 4,000 bucks on a, on a product launch on, on Black Friday, yeah, that's, especially in the Trumpet community, that's, that's not bad, no, not bad at all. <laughs> so, uh, you know, when, when you got that feeling of like, yes, you know, not only can I do it, but it's going to be something that can be profitable. It could be, it could be marketed. Um, you know, did that, did that clarity, uh, give you energy then to move forward into the, the next steps or, you know, uh, or did it just like blow your head up and make you go, ah. it was, I was, I was incredibly relieved to have been done. Because like, like I said, it had been hanging over my head since 2015. It had been five years. And, and I'm not kidding when I say that I would wake up every day and while I was having breakfast, it was always in the back of my mind. I should be doing this. I should be editing right now. I should be putting this out. It was always there. Um, it was a huge source of stress. Um, but eventually, you know, that did come about. Um, and when I finished it, I was incredibly relieved. I was pumped because there was, there was this audience that wanted to, that was interested in my, in my product. And, and I was especially happy just because I, I knew, and I know that my product is legit, you know, it's professional. Like I'm an actual trumpet player, um, who knows what they're doing. I'm, I'm 
a very good teacher. Um, I teach 100%, like that's my full-time job. That's what I do every day. I teach students in person and then I assist people online and I do private consultations on Wednesdays. So it, you know, I like, I just knew I was selling something real and that really, really gave me the strength to be like, okay, well, um, I'm serious about this. So after everything got done with that Black Friday sale, I was excited because I felt like I finally had the time and the faith from people out there, right? To be able to expand the course. So uh, that's when, uh, that's chapter four, expanding the course. <laughs> so, you know, about, about two or three months after everything had passed, you know, I took a little time off to finally relax, to breathe. Um, and then I'm looking at the videos and I'm thinking, all right, well, you know, this is for real now. Like this is a professional business. Um, I need to redo this so that they look really, really pro. And so that they stand strong against um, competition that's already out there or competition that's to come. Um, you know, I can't, it can't be with this, uh, this camera anymore and this lighting and these angles, it's gotta be super, super, just very high quality production value. And I set out to redo every single video that I had done, which was about 55 videos total. I redid all of them and I added 15 new ones because I had learned a lot of things along the way. Um, and I did that in one third of the time that it had taken me the first time. Why? Because I had learned so much on how to do things that it was so much faster this time around. It was no less stressful by any means. I was still super stressed out. But this time, you know, I have a backdrop. Like you can't see it in the video, but there's a little string over there where, you know, I pull it and the backdrop comes out. Um, and all the videos are in 4K. Um, the lighting is, is professional lighting. Like, you know, all these things just kind of came together. So it was, it was going back to every single video and watching every single video, taking notes, um, being extremely thorough that I didn't slip and introduce something accidentally that, you know, I didn't want to talk about yet to confuse people. So, so I did that. Um, and insane. So part of that new, the new course that just actually launched, uh, this Black Friday, about a month ago, I guess, um, or a few, a few weeks ago, part of that new course includes the training room, which is a brand new aspect of the course. So now the course has, um, the area where you learn. So you go and you watch the tutorials where I explain how to execute certain techniques and what to do, what not to do, certain problems that are very common that you should watch out for, things like that. And then in the training room, you go and actually practice. So in the training room, it's more like a workout video where you just press play and you follow along. And so those are all new material. And that's also part of what I created. So I recreated everything I had done and I added, I added all these other 60 videos for actual practicing, um, which have music on the screen and, you know, and me so that you can actually see fingerings and, and things like that. Um, but I mean, it's insane. I, I don't, I expected it to take me a lot less. Of course, we always underestimate the time it's going to take us to do things uh, for stuff like like this. And um, and in the end, I actually couldn't finish everything I wanted to finish by Black, by this Black Friday. And I was really disappointed about that. And I, I just kept saying, God, I wish I had, you know, been able to do this and been able to do that. I got sick for two weeks in no early November uh, with some mysterious illness. And, um, and that threw everything off. So I couldn't finish. So, you know, again, my fiance came to the rescue and uh, she's like, well, just put out what, what you made. It's still amazing, you know, and then trickle, trickle everything else as you go. And it can be things that you are uh, feeding your clients slowly over time. So it's cool because they get new stuff every week. 
and that's what's that's what's happening now so i'm i'm, I'm trickling stuff until probably till march and then it'll be over over and then i have so many more ideas of things i want to add to the course because as long as i keep having ideas it's probably never gonna never gonna be over yeah well of course you know you're, you're creative and so you're always going to be thinking about something that's you know you, you get a new idea you, you can do this a little bit better yeah that's 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 part of the game but yeah it sounds to me like your relationship is a very interesting uh, and, and well balanced one, where where you have all these creative energies, and and uh, and your uh, your partner is the the kind of uh, somewhat detached voice of reason. It's like, yeah, hey, well, why don't you just do this, you know? And it it it, it uh, oh yeah, I I didn't you, because you're so focused on on this that you can't see that little spot over there and. And I, I think I don't, I definitely can't see it. It is so far from my view. <laughs> I don't even know it's there. Well, and that's, you know, like even thinking about like, uh, you know, with, with playing and things like that, that, that sometimes we, you know, we're as being like the, the artist or the person, the creative, the person that that's doing that job. Uh, it's hard for us to see uh, that there are things that, that people would, would benefit from that, you know, we had we're, we're looking at the we're looking at the big picture uh in some ways and then we we lose sight of the fact that well like you're saying earlier you know people just need to be educated entertained and you know enjoy themselves so uh if you can provide that right now then you know you can you can always come back and do more later so that's that's really great you have a great relationship so make sure make sure you you treat her right don't <laughs> I, i'm telling you yeah. You got to hold on to that one. Yeah, exactly. That's a winner. Um, so this, yeah, this is one of those questions I, I really, I hate asking. And I, I've said this every time I've had a, a, a female guest on, uh, and I hate asking because of that, that uh, there is this gender bias that exists, uh, not just in the Trump world, but societally. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's very, yeah, unless you have experienced it, it's hard, uh, in, especially like in, in that bias it, specifically. I don't understand that bias, but I understand biases in general because I've had to deal with it in terms of of race relationships. But you know, when you think about race and gender and and uh, gender identification and you know all these different things where people judge you, um, and uh, how it, it's so hard to deal with sometimes and not let it crush your spirit. So. How have you, I mean, have you had any situations where you've just really had to, to, you know, tough it out because you, you're getting a lot of backlash because you were uh, a female trumpet player as opposed to, you know, one of these, you know, old white men uh, that seem to predominate the pedagogy, um, you know, and I'm not saying that in the racist way, you know, don't take offense people, but, you know, that's, that's the primary. Uh, yeah. That's, yeah, that, that's the model, yeah. you know? So, uh, have you, have you had to, to stand up for yourself in the past and, and say that, you know, you deserve to be doing what you're doing as well, as much as anybody else, or, you know, how, how have you dealt with those kind of issues? Um, as, as far as it being like really forward, like a very obvious display of, um, um, patriarchal injustice. Uh, I've, oh, that's really only happened to me one time. And it was just like, he was this old white guy. I had been hired on a gig. Uh, this was back in my gigging days. And uh, I had been hired to play trumpet one and he was playing trumpet two. And the whole gig, he was so mad that I was on one. And then he made an un, a comment under his breath, like, oh, hiring a woman to play one, you know? Um, and, uh, and my, you know, I, I have just never cared enough what people think. I've just never cared enough. And I think I got that from my mom and I find myself to be very blessed that I, that I don't, because I think it would be very difficult to do some things that I do, um, if that was front and center all the time, but I was really just, uh, I just said, you know, ex excuse me. And he said, oh, nothing. And I'm like, well, if you have something to say, say it out loud. And I was saying, I was speaking loud enough for people around us to hear us because it, it was pretty quiet hall uh, that, that morning. And there were 
probably five or six people around us and everyone just like you know <laughs> turned over and and he was on the spotlight suddenly and uh and that's really all it took for him to to be quiet and behave himself for the rest of the gig um because you know if you don't say anything then then you're not bringing attention to it and if you don't bring attention you don't bring the discomfort and if you don't if they're not uncomfortable that's just going to keep happening now um that's really the only time where it's been really really direct um i actually haven't thought about that in, in years um but apart from that you know i was always the only woman in trumpet sections uh my first year in my graduate degree i was one out of 27 uh trumpet players all guys and then me um i I never once felt like, you know, anyone in the studio was biased towards me because I was a woman. They were all really, really good, really supportive. Now, that's not to say that, you know, they were all, they were always having this, this locker room talk, what, you know, whatever that means um, around me. And, and I found that really offensive. And so I would, I would have to like speak up all the time and be like, hey, can you just, be more respectful, like, you know, in general, but also I'm right here. Um, they were talking about some other girl, right, or, or whatever. Um, you know, always having to deal with that, always sitting at, you know, after after gig uh, restaurant uh, hangouts uh, with just a bunch of guys. Um, I don't know, you know, you miss it. You miss being with people of your own gender um, because it's, it's a very, very different dynamic when you have 10 guys and one woman, then five guys and five women. It's totally different environment. Um, now, having said that, I have never really felt that, um, that I was prejudiced against, that I didn't do an opportunity because I'm a woman. I never once felt that way. And honestly, like, I'll be honest with you, I don't think about that a lot. I never have. I've never found myself thinking I shouldn't do this because I'm a woman. Um, it's not even in my, it's not in my radar. And I think that because I carry myself that way and I'm assertive and I'm confident in what I do, that people feel that. And, and then, you know, no one dares to say anything. If they were going to say anything, well, maybe they don't, or maybe, you know, or maybe it has nothing to do with that. But I really feel like it's so, it has so much to do about the energy that you put out and you, you know the confidence you have in yourself um and and what things are are interesting about you you know it you know are you interested because you're an intellectual um so i don't know that's that's always a question that you know it comes up some sometimes and i always end up saying that it's just it's just not something i personally think about now that's not to say i don't i'm not you know i'm i'm not not thinking about all the injustices um especially you know in the music community um there's been a lot about that and i i think again i'm maybe i'm just very lucky that i've never faced any of those yeah yeah well that's yeah good good for you um because hey yeah i i will, I will be the first person going to record to say this um gentlemen please don't take offense to this uh in general guys are jerks guys are jerks especially trumpet playing guys now but yeah it's i think when you're in a fraternity and, and by that i don't mean like a greek fraternity but when you're when you're in a, a specialized group of people um that it's very easy to fall into these uh little more ancient tribal kind of rituals and and the uh, the things that we fall into is uh, of uh, how we establish uh, our place in a pack and, uh, you know, the dominance and the, the preening and, and this and that and the other thing. It, it can get it can get confusing. And God, trumpet players can be some of the most testosterone filled <laughs> idiots in the world. And God knows I'm one of them. But, uh, you know, the ability to traverse that space um you know whether it be because of gender whether it be because of of race whether it be because of age because as you were mentioning earlier about you know uh you know being a younger 
teacher as opposed to an older teacher. You know, it's, it's one thing when you, know, I've got 70 years of experience. Okay, well, you haven't learned anything new in, in 65 of those years, as opposed to, you know, someone who's, who maybe has a fresher approach, uh, who, who the, the memory of, of what it takes to be a, a beginning or struggling uh, player, uh, that, that's fresher in your mind. So it makes you more capable to speak to uh, the audience that you have in front of you. Um, I think it's just, it's, it's sometimes we fall into those, those bad coping patterns that have been uh, part of our civilization for, for centuries, uh, as opposed to, you know, trying to reach for a higher level of understanding and, and uh, enlightenment. Um, so I, I think that being able to embrace the diversity that exists in our art and the world in general, uh, I think that's the only way that we're going to take things to the next level. So um, just like with technology, you know, embracing technology is such a critical uh, component. So, uh, you know, when you're talking earlier about the, you know, making that transition into the world of technology, uh, especially uh, membership-based courses and things like that, um, you know, what, what is the biggest mental obstacle that you personally had to overcome with being able to w be 100% bought into this is something that not only you could do, but should be done? Um, well, probably the, the, the biggest obstacle, uh, you mean mentally? Yeah. Probably the biggest obstacle was what I, you know, what I talked about earlier, which is just the, the doubt, you know, is anyone actually going to buy this? Am I going to just be wasting my time? That was, that was a really, really big one for me. Mm -hmm. um, and like I said, support, you know, from the village uh, was really important. I also did, um, I meditate and I, I do journaling and that really helps to bring things, bring things into perspective, just having some quiet time, you know, where you're, where you're thinking and you're not, um, or sorry, where you're not thinking <laughs> and you can let things go, uh, so that you can be more clear headed when you come back to, uh, to work or whatever that may be. Um, so yeah, that was, that was, that was really the hardest part of the whole thing. Yeah. What's the, what's the biggest challenge that, that you have had uh, in the ongoing presentation of your information with, you know, dealing with, uh, like today I was just, I was teaching a, a private virtual class, uh, a martial arts class, and which is something that traditionally you didn't do, uh, you know, on online, you know, you had to be face to face to do that. Uh, and there's certain limitations of, of what I could do. So I had to find new ways to explain things as opposed to, you know, put somebody's body in a position. So um, to me, that, that was always a challenge, but I looked at it as a, a challenge being, this is an obstacle that's put my way to help me to become better at what I do. So in, in terms of your teaching of trumpet, what are the, the obstacles that you have been dealing with in the actual uh, pedagogical process that uh, you know, are forcing you to rethink and to refine your, your teaching skills? Um, as far as, like virtual live lessons or in the course, pre-recorded material? Both. Okay, so in, in live lessons, it's a lot easier. Um, so usually, you know, the, the, biggest, the biggest issue for me for live lessons um, was that because a student is not right in front of me, I can't just get close to their faces and, and see these, these things. Um, most of my students show up with existing issues that I diagnose and then I provide a plan to get them back on track. And, um, and that requires me to, you know, to see a lot of things, to see how their lips are on the mouthpiece and their jaw positions and their um, different movements that they might be making that are unnecessary, uh, things like that. And so when we are in a virtual setting, that's, that's kind of hard to see. So usually first lesson, I ask them to, you know, be really close to the camera to play and then turn profile one way, play the same thing, turn profile the other way, play the same thing with the camera really close. Sometimes we have to get, you know, help from a parent or someone else in the household to come and hold the camera close to them. Um, but that's really all it takes. Apart from that, you know, there is, everyone talks about tone and how can you really hear the tone, right? 
trust me, after you've been doing this for long enough, you can hear the tone. You know, I, I, I hear that a lot. That, that's like a big thing that floats out there uh, with people that are wanting to get into virtual lessons or, or are brand new to them. And honestly, like I'm just being super, super honest, it comes down to experience. You know, if you're worrying about tone or like you, you can't hear something, you just don't have enough experience teaching because you can hear it. Even if the sound quality was awful, I would know a great player from anyone or a or mediocre one, whatever. Um, you can hear, you can still hear the quality of, of tone. Now, having said that, there are times when the audio, but you know, I, I have had times where like a student from Europe or something has a super old computer and a really bad connection. Now, if the connection is going in and out, I'm not gonna be able to do anything with you. Um, you know, it needs to be steady at least. Um, but I've never really run into, into too many issues with that. Now, you know, a, a way that I do go around that is I have them record themselves with something like a modern device, like a phone, which most people have modern phones now. And then they send me the recording and then that's how I can compare and make sure that I am on the same page um, between devices. That's very easily done. Um, so yeah, it, it's really not, you, you can do, I've done embouchure changes. I've done absolutely everything online. You can do it. It just takes experience. Yeah. Well, that's cool. Uh, so let me ask you this question. Um, in terms of, uh, you know, trumpet pedagogy, uh, looking at the, the grand scheme of things, um, what do you see as being uh, the the biggest hole in in our approach to to teaching trumpet, uh, and how are you actively trying to fill that hole? Hmm, that is a good one. Probably the you know the biggest issue I see in trumpet education. This is this is from um, this is I'm thinking about like high school, middle school educators, right? Band directors and things like that. Um, that's a huge problem, huge huge problem because most of them don't play trumpet, and if they do play trumpet, they played it on the side while they were doing their education degree, not a performance degree. And um, they really, well, they just don't know the ins and outs of teaching the instrument. And so, you know, they teach superficially a lot of the times, and, which is really understandable because that's not the focus of their degree. Focus of their degree is to be able to teach a wide variety of instruments to conduct, right? To lead an ensemble, uh, but with difficult high brass instruments like trumpet and French horn, it causes, can cause a lot of problems because we, we do need to do certain things that other instruments don't need to do. They're also really high maintenance instruments in the sense that we need to play basically daily to maintain muscle strength. Otherwise it just goes out the window and these kids are not being taught that at all. So that's, that's one thing, right? That's from one perspective. Now, on the other side, I do notice um, that there's a big gap in like specifically job placement. Um, a lot of younger teachers, you know, maybe like fresh out of college or, or maybe not a whole lot of teaching experience um, that teach the trumpet without readjusting job placement so that, you know, the horn is basically pointing down and it's very low. The jaw never comes out to align the teeth, which is what we should always have in trumpet playing so we can have a, a, a weight distribution right on the top and the bottom teeth that is even, um, that is conducive of good lip vibration, good airflow, all these different things. I find that missing a lot of the time. I get a lot of students that come to me with issues uh, that had a teacher before and the teacher never taught them to do that. It is probably my most prevalent issue uh, and trumpet players. And a lot of them just taught themselves and you're not going to find this information on YouTube. <laughs> uh, so it's impossible for them, for them to know. Now, every once in a while, you know, they don't need to do that. It depends on teeth formation and all these different things. But most of the time, most people, yeah, we actually do need to do that. Okay, cool. Good question. So, uh, where were we? Chapter four? Is there a chapter five? 
Uh, we were we were chapter that was that was chapter four. Um, chapter I don't I don't know if that there's a I mean I know that there is a chapter five. <laughs> but it, it hasn't been completely written yet. You're 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 in the process of writing chapter five. I'm I'm mulling over chapter five. Well, basically, I mean the you know the future of the course is is expansion. So actually, after I finish all the training room stuff, which is probably going to be done in the next three or four months. I have plans to do um, duets, trios, quartets, uh, you know, trumpet ensemble stuff as part of the course where um, I, you know, I want students to be able to go in and just pick the part that they want to play. And then uh, they can jump in and play with, with an ensemble, you know, um, which is great for blending in and learning how, how you fit, learning to um, play your part when there are other distractions especially for beginners. Um, so yeah, and then there's there's a bunch of other things. I mean, there, you know, there's so many holes in this in this world of virtual learning. Like um, I, I have a student forum. So my students can go in and they can submit like videos or pictures of themselves playing and I provide, you know, custom feedback. Um, but, you know, a, a lot of them still struggle with with practicing. And what do I play? You know, I, I talk about this in the course, uh, but sometimes you have to you have to repeat, you know, as teachers, we have to repeat things many, many times over many, many weeks until it finally sinks in. And with an online course, I don't have control over how many times they're going to watch that video. I don't know if I see you week to week, I'll just keep telling you. Um, but if it's just you now, I don't know how many times you're going to watch that and let the concept actually sink in. So I am in the process of creating um, uh, a solution for that um, so that it's a no brainer and so that you'll know what to play, when to play, how long to play um, with all the resources that you're going to need. I'm not going to unwrap that yet. It's in it's in the process. And that's what we call in the business a teaser, folks. That's a teaser. <laughs> um, so and, and so here's here's a. Uh... Here's an entrepreneurial geeky question for cool. you. Um, what is your, your ideal customer avatar? My ideal customer avatar. Okay. Um, so that, that means my, my, my ideal client. Yeah. Uh, who, yeah so, so that is, that's the big thing, uh, or at least the big thing it was a year or two ago. Uh, was, you know, really sitting down and drilling into who exactly you're, you're, you're building your product for, you know, who's, who's the, and some people are so anal about it. It's like, they want you to, to be down to, you know, the age, the height, you know, to actually build <laughs> a visual representation of who you are serving. But if you, you know, if you had to, you know, at least generally create this, this uh, ideal uh, student for your product, um, you know, who, who would that be? I think really, really, I mean, ideally, um, adults between the ages of maybe 25 and 40 who are familiar with technology, you know, who aren't struggling to find the login button, which does happen. Um, um, and who are, you know, curious about where to click and what to do in there, because it is a virtual trumpet course. So, you know, sometimes I get a lot of questions. Um, you know, how, how do I get to the student forum? It's all it's all very right there. But sometimes, you know, some people are just less versed in that in that world. But 25 to 40 year olds are pretty familiar. And so they're going to find it easily. Those are the best students because they find it. They ask questions. They are involved. Um, and then also just people with time. Lots and lots of people don't realize that the trumpet is not like the guitar. It's just not going to be, it's just not going to be like that, right? So, you know, sometimes I get people that work nine to fives and, you know, they're super tired and they don't practice till the weekend. And at, at that point, well, you know, I don't think it's going to work out. So people with enough time that can at least commit an hour a day, every day, are super ideal and could know a little bit more, um, just some, just more basic technology knowledge. That's the ideal person who really wants to 
play, who are, you know, passionate about the horn, committed. All right. Well, that's good. So if that's you, make sure you sign up for this class. <laughs> exactly. All right. Well, uh, before we, uh, we finish today, I have uh, three segments we need to get through. These are my standard segments for each episode. Uh, and the first one is brought to us uh, by Barkley Microphones. It's called Sound Doll. Uh, and uh, in this, I just would like to talk to you a little bit about um, your approach to developing the right sound, uh, the, the right trumpet sound. So as uh, someone who is a expert on, uh, on teaching and, and uh, virtual teaching, we are now in a virtual forum. So if there's like one piece of advice that you would give people to improve the quality of their sound, what would it be? Get an interface. Don't get a USB microphone, get an interface and hook it up separately with an XLR cable. That's going to make a big difference. Ah, yes, yes, yes. That's, uh, in, you know, that's why, you know, Barkley mics are so good. So you can, uh, you can get one of these nice high quality, uh, ribbon microphones and you'll sound great on your lessons and, and in your recordings as well. Uh, so for, uh, in terms of like, uh, the, your, your concepts for, for trumpet sound, um, what are like, what, what's one of the most common, uh, the common suggestions that you give out to people, uh, for, you know, making, making their trumpet sound like a beautiful trumpet? Well, I mean, space has a lot to do with it, you know? So if you're super echo, like my, my office is actually really echoey. So when I record, I have to lay down blankets everywhere. Um, so to just, you know, make sure that, that you have that, to have a good, a good microphone, I have a, I have a blue uh, spark microphone here with an interface and just test it out. You know, it, it might take you the whole day, literally. It might take you the whole day to find the sweet spot, but put your microphone in somewhere around the center of your space and then start messing with the gain and proximity to the mic. For me, it works much, much better to be far away from the mic with like a mid gain setting than if I was closer with a lower gain setting. That makes it sound really too, too, uh, too poppy, right? And then trumpet gets very loud, like 38 or 40 decibels or whatnot, I think it is. It's very, very loud. So if you're too close, you're, you're gonna be spiking a lot. Um, so for me, it's always worth to just get a little bit further away uh, to find the sweet spot. But honestly, it's just all about experimentation. Be prepared to record about a hundred different, you know, ditties that, that day. Do, 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 do. Just do that a hundred times from a hundred different spots and you'll find the right one. <laughs> repetition, repetition, repetition. All right. Well, our next segment is uh, called Geared Up. This is brought to us by Venture Microphones, where technology, design, and craftsmanship intersect. And uh, if you use the code TrumpetGurus21 at your order, you get 10% off. So mm -hmm. you can save money as you're buying that brand new mouthpiece. Um, so Geared Up is about uh, your concept for, uh, for trumpet gear. And yeah, you know, not necessarily, you know, you need to buy this specific horn, but just what are some of the things that, that as a, as an educator that you guide people towards thinking about and, uh, the approach to picking the right gear for your, uh, for your trumpet needs? Um, as far as that, I mean, beginners should have one that is reliable, not a $150 horn from Walmart. Um, that's not going to be very reliable. It's not going to, you know, it's not going to be as uh, the resistance, the tone, the feedback you get from it, not the same. So, uh, for beginners, like on a budget, you usually beginners are on a budget. And so I actually guide them to the John Packer, um, beginner trumpet, which is a wonderfully priced and it sounds great. I have a couple of them here myself, uh, including the cornet, um, they're very affordable and they sound so, so, so nice. Um, it's definitely a much more affordable version than a Bach or, you know, an entry-level Bach or a Yamaha, which are also great horns, uh, but they're gonna be a lot more expensive. Um, so, you know, I always stick to right around there. Um, and then as far as, you know, mouthpieces, it's just important to start on a standard mouthpiece for the love of God. Please don't start on a, on a shallow mouthpiece. I see this all the time. Um, you know, just a nice 7C or maybe a 5C, just kind of depending. 
Um, it depends if you're really young, you know, with little small teeth still or, or whatnot, but usually you want to just stick around there. You need the room in the mouthpiece. You need the room to develop your embouchure. And then once you start developing, then you're going to know what you actually need. And then you can go from there and start tweaking two or three years down the road. But first you want to stick to those more standard, um, more standard equipment. Okay. Solid, solid advice. All right. Uh, our final segment, uh, this is brought to us by our friends at Robinson's Remedies, products for your tired, beat up chop, show your chops and love uh, with Robinson's Remedies. And this is our Robinson's Remedies rapid fire round. This is a series of questions that kind of bounce all over the place. And uh, I just right. need the quickest response to these okay. questions. So Estella, are you ready? I hope so. All right, here we go. First question for you today. Who's the biggest influence on your life that is not a trumpet player? Walt Disney. Mm, okay. Uh, what is your favorite book? Well, this is really not rapid fire. The Alchemist. Okay. <laughs> uh, what's the worst movie you've ever seen? Napoleon Dynamite. Uh, if you weren't a trumpet player, what would you want to be? I would want to be, uh, I forget what, what they call them, but people that uh, specialize in uh, the development of languages within cultures. Okay, I think they're called the people who specialize in development of languages and cultures. That's their official name. <laughs> uh, what is your favorite drink? Water. Uh, you could have a dinner party and invite any three living people, any three people on the face of the earth could come to this party. Who would you want to have there? Uh, John Williams, George Lucas, and Michelle Obama. Mm, okay. Uh, and you have three additional chairs at your dinner table to invite any three people from history. Um, Walt Disney, Rosa Parks, and um, uh, Louise Mayalka. Not a trumpet player in sight. That's that's an odd. Uh, good for you. Yeah, it's a it's a very weird thing, but I have no like big trumpet I idols. It's just not. I don't know why. Uh, hey, that's okay. Uh, you're there to represent, so you know you're, we're in good place. Uh, lacquer plated or raw? I'm sorry. What? Lacquer plated or raw? Plated. Okay. What's your favorite quote? Great things don't come from comfort zones. Hmm. What is your greatest fear? Being really old and regretting things. You could only have one superpower. You have many superpowers, but you can only have, you can be granted one superpower. Uh, what would it be? Teleportation. Hmm. Okay. Uh, what aspect of trumpet playing do you feel is the most overrated? High notes. And what aspect do you feel is the most underrated? Tom. You can go back in time and give your younger self one piece of advice about music. What would it be? Just be yourself. And uh, one piece of advice about life. When you're scared of something, just go and do it anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay. Final question for you, Estella. What do you want your legacy to be? I would love to remember it as someone who was kind and um, a good educator. All right. Well, you're well on your way to making that dream a reality. So um, I want to thank you very much for uh, taking time to be with me today and to, to share what you, you've got going on. And I'm really excited to hear about what you have planned next for chapter five, six, seven, and 22. Uh, so, uh, hopefully when you're ready to launch your, your next phase, uh, you'll drop by and give me a visit and, and we can kind of pick up where we left off and, and, uh, cause I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of stuff that happens between now and then. So. <laughs> yes. I'll come back with a whole new set of problems that happened. I'm <laughs> sure. Um, but absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Jose. This was a lot of fun. Ah, uh, well, I'm glad. And. Thank you for spending time with us on this episode of The Hang. Make sure that you like, subscribe, share, uh, do whatever you need to do to, uh, to keep us going. And uh, you know, we're, we're here for you. Drop us a line if you have any questions or comments. And uh, 
we uh, hopefully will have some some more fun with Estella in, in the not too distant future. So as always, folks, peace and slide grease. We out. Thanks for hanging with us today. This podcast is all about creating deeper connections through our mutual love of music and the trumpet life. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast and also like and share this episode with a friend. We want to see the hang grow for show. Please support our sponsors and consider becoming a personal supporter of this podcast as well. Remember, for less than the price of a bottle of valve oil a month, you can keep this podcast moving smoothly. The Trumpet Guru's Hang is recorded at the Candy Factory, a co-working space and social club located in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Jose Johnson is the executive producer. Post-production editing is by Mitch Bowers. Our opening theme song was composed and performed by Lexi Signor. And our closing theme music comes courtesy of The Greatest Funeral Ever. Incidental music is by Ethan Swayze and Jose Johnson. Graphic design by Ann Kirby of The Sweet Corps. The Trumpet Guru's Hang podcast is produced in collaboration with the So Good Lancaster Media Group. Mm-hmm.